Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. And then we move uh, quickly to the last paper. And I would remind uh, present and discussions to be also very sharp in time because we are a little bit behind. Uh, this paper will be presented um, by Ernest Dautovic uh, from the ECB. Thanks to the organizer for, uh, for inviting us here to the conference. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thanks also to the scientific committee for selecting our paper. I will be presenting a joint work with uh, Leonardo Gambacorta from the BIS and uh, Alessio Regezza from the ECB. The paper is entitled Supervisory Policy Stimulus Evidence from the Euro-Area Dividend Recommendation. And yes, uh, still disclaimer for me, the views expressed here in this paper are, of course, of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the BIS or the ECB views. It's not full screen. I don't know if it has to be full screen, but anyway. The COVID-19 pandemic has prompted governments and central banks to implement innovative policy solutions. One of the main innovations was the introduction of the policy to restrict dividend distributions. In Europe, on 27th March 2020, the banking supervision arm of the ECB adopted a recommendation asking, but not obliging banks, to refrain from dividend distributions. The objective of the recommendation was to ensure that credit institutions will continue to fund small and medium enterprises and strengthen their capacity to absorb losses. To our knowledge, this is an unprecedented policy. It is the first type of supervisory policy that restricts dividends, that at least recommends banks to, to not pay out dividends. A bit of the literature background. Uh, in restricting dividend payments, uh, there are, of course, caveats to be kept in mind. Public policy must be crucial not to create unintended additional distortions that exceed the benefits of restrictions. It is worth pointing out that dividend restrictions can have also negative effects on banks. The first one that comes to mind, of course, is the stock price effect. And there is evidence on that. Those negative effects are generally, however, short-lived. The stock prices still maintain a mean reverting behavior. And this can suggest that the initial market reaction can be excessive. At the same time, the idea of restricting dividend payments to support lending is not new. Literature has already argued in that front and argued for banking sector-wide dividend restrictions in crisis. While dividends represent the legitimate distribution of profits uh, to shareholders and normally play an important role of allocation of capital between savings and, uh, and investments, empirical evidence suggests that in times of crisis, banks tend to expand dividend distributions instead of reducing them. This is a, this as a signaling device, but this also imp imp implies that they act procyclically. Finding a balance is not easy, of course, and in crisis, however, supervised intervention can be justified on those fronts. The next slide shows you the dividend capital allocation of the bank's managers and, uh, and some insights on, on what we see in the data. Bank managers face a choice of capital allocation when deciding to follow the ECB recommendation. On the one hand, they may opt to use surplus capital to increase lending supply, thus supporting the economy and acting contracyclically. This seems to be confirmed in our data. The chart shows you the spike of div not distributed dividends following the ECB recommendation and the spike in lending in March after March 2020. On the one hand, bank managers, however, can, can still decide to signal and increase their resilience to future shocks by saving capital or strengthening their loss of social capacity, setting aside loss, uh, loan loss provisions. In short, the impact on the, of the dividend recommendation on lending is not a given, and different things have to be considered. What we do in the study, we try to estimate the impact on lending growth to non-financial corporates, first and foremost, and then we try to investigate also this, how this credit allocation across firms have changed. We look at vulnerable and non-vulnerable sectors in the economy and those more affected or less affected by COVID. Finally, we look at the riskier behavior by banks and if there is any. Our data, the dividend data that we have uh, are coming from the SSM or ECB supervisory banking supervision survey that was held, that was conducted in March, 2020. The chart shows the aggregate figures from dividend distribution plans and intuitively shows that the bank's payout ratio out of fiscal year 2019 earnings is 45%. However, if we condition on banks that have positive dividend plans, this ratio goes to 57%. What can be seen is that 
the middle yellow bar is the 27.6 billions of 2019 dividend retentions. These dividends are the ones that are the focus of our paper and that were withheld following the ECB recommendation. In terms of regulatory capital, this amount could be read as an additional release of 33 basis points of CAT1 capital that banks can use to provide supply, credit supply, capital increase, or loan loss provisions. Identification. So this slide briefly guides you through the identification that we, that we exploit in this paper. Our main variable of interest is the non-dividend, not distributed dividends, planned but not distributed dividends over liquidated assets. This is, this is basically a, the measure of the intensity of treatment. The chart shows that the distribution of this variable in the baseline sample, and there is a spike at zero. It's around 40% of observations, which refer to our control group. This is formed by two types of banks, banks that did not have any plan to distribute dividends, and banks that distributed all that they planned to, to distribute before the March 2020 recommendation. Then we have the remaining 60% of observations that have distributed across this, this chart, and they refer to our treatment group. Those are the banks that follow the ECB and did not distribute their dividends. For identification, we then rely on different features, uh, but uh, the, the, the most important ones is that we take the survey prior to the ECB recommendation that took place, which means that self-selection issues and endogeneity issues that may follow after the, after the period are, are kept in check or at least the biases in our estimates can be kept in check. And of course, the COVID pandemic is widely recognized as exogenous shock to the economy, and therefore also the dividend recommendation by the ECB could not have been anticipated by the banks. Then secondly, the decision on dividends is predetermined to the COVID shock and to the dividend recommendation. And, one, and, and, this, and the dividend recommendation will not affect those. And finally, the econometric framework, we rely on credit registry data to to isolate firm demand effects. And to this end, we use the anacredit, the credit registry data of the, of the, of the euro area. And this allows to control for unobserved heterogeneity in credit demand at firm level. And in extreme synthesis, we do what the rest of the literature does here, is comparing two banks lending to the same firm, but banks being di differently affected by the dividend recommendation, some of them being more and some of them less. To do a correct estimate, or at least to try to do a correct estimate, we need to focus also on the confounding effects that are happening at the same time. Different type of policies, fiscal, monetary, prudential policies, have been implemented at the same time of the dividend recommendation. So keeping in check those is not easy. We try to do our best by collecting the data that we have here at disposal at the ECB. And we focus in particular uh, on fiscal policy measure, monetary policy measures, and prudential policies. On the left-hand side chart, with respect to fiscal policies, we control for government guarantees, the blue line, moratorium debt repayments, the red line, both, which both aim at support uh, credit uh, during the COVID crisis. As you can see, all of those variables spike at the same time. We then include in the model measures of unconventional monetary policies, the asset purchase programs and the TLTRSO, TLTROs, which at the same time as well were enacted by the, by the ECB. On the right-hand side chart, instead, shows the fall in off-balance sheets, off-balance sheet exposures, which, which are mostly credit lines in blue. As you might know, credit line drawdowns were one of the main sources of credit for NFCs during the, during the early phase of the pandemic. And when they are drawn, they are automatically moved to balance sheet, increasing lending mechanically. We add in the second control set other two measures of prudential policies, namely the combined buffer requirement and the P2G releases, which have been touched upon earlier. This chart shows the first results of, of our paper. Uh, in columns one and two, we have the baseline, where we see that a positive relationship between non-distributed dividends and uh, credit growth. More specifically, a one percentage point increase of dividend, non-distributed non dividends over risk weighted assets is associated with additional lending growth of 4.3 percentage points. To understand the economic significance of these effects, we note that conditional on treated banks the average ratio of non-distributed dividends over risk weighted assets is half percentage points. So we can, as a rule of thumb, halve those estimates to see how much more lending was provided during this period by those banks. And we come up with the 2.1, 2.2 percentage points 
of higher lending by treated banks with respect to the controls. In column three and four, we assess whether the supervisory dividend stimulus is directed toward micro, small, and medium enterprises. From a policymaker's perspective, it is important to ensure that those firms are provided funding in a crisis, in particular because those are the ones that have higher difficulties of accessing credit and they cannot rely on uh, financial markets to, to fund themselves, or usually do not rely on financial markets to fund themselves. We find that the, the, they find that the impacts are strong for those small and medium enterprises. However, lending growth to micro enterprises is lower, and significantly so. This suggests that micro enterprises can be perceived as riskier or more vulnerable during periods of systemic shocks, in line with theories of pecking order that have been recently published in the, in the literature. In column five to six, we focus instead on vulnerable sectors, and we look at the firms and the sectors that were most affected in terms of revenue by the COVID-19 lockdowns. And we see that the impacts are higher for, for actually for those firms, uh, and significantly so with respect to the, the, the firms that were not. This suggests that dividend restrictions may have helped also to some firms to survive the COVID shock, and which will otherwise have not. We don't have evidence on that, but uh, these findings point to that direction. The next slide, I would like to show you some interactions with government guarantees. The results reported in column one and two are important for two reasons. First, in the first row, the coefficient of non-government guaranteed loans is positive, sizable and statistically significant, even though at only 10% level, indicating that credit supply grew independently of the government support. Second, we find strong complementarity with this fiscal policy measure as the interaction term shows, and most of our effects are driven by those guaranteed loans. Column three and four instead focus a bit on the distance to MDA, which was also explained earlier in the previous presentation, and is the main measure of capital space a bank has at disposal to distribute more loans. Point estimates indicate that most of our results are explained by banks with higher capital space. We think that this finding points to the possibility that banks close to the MDA trigger are likely to have used the non-distributed dividends to build up much needed capital instead of lending. The last results that I would like to show looks at the risk taking by banks. We define zombie firms as those firms above the 95th percentile of accumulated impairments within a bank firm relationship, and as of, two, and as of 2019 Q4, to avoid endogeneity effects. Lending to such zombie firms will call for a type of gambling for resurrection. Excessive risk taking by banks of the, this type could result in additional not needed losses. The results, however, indicate that the increase in lending supply is not driven by those firms with the substantial impairments. If anything, lending to those firms is lower, as column six shows, and in particular, the marginal effect of lending to more problematic zombie borrowers is not statistically different from zero, as shown from columns three to, four to six. In the last two columns, we turn to MPL ratios and banks with structurally high MPLs. We see that those banks do not take on additional risks. Actually, they, these banks take on less risk and most of the loans are provided by banks with low NPR ratios. Finally, let me turn to some conclusions and policy implications. Dividend restrictions, we hope, can be, after showing this evidence in the paper, can be an effective policy to sustain credit in the, in the, in the, in the crisis, in the downturn. A proven, proven counter-cyclical supervisory policy that was the first time that was enacted. But possibly, this can be used also in financial crisis too. Of course, it depends on the type of crisis. Dividend restrictions can enforce the effectiveness of countercyclical policy, and they can work together with other, other type of policies, fiscal policies, monetary policies, or other type of financial policies. The second point we'd like to make is that dividend restrictions can effectively move financial resources from inefficiently high shareholder consumptions to credit supply. Our results show that non-distributed dividends are channeled to loans, which are likely to have a higher growth multiplier than consumptions of, of shareholders, in particular in the downturn. And we note that at the same time, banks could benefit from this additional credit through higher not net interest income. Few more aspects we think are worth highlighting. A caveat is due. The temporary nature of dividend restriction is, however, necessary to limit unintended policy effects. So strong components of supervisory forward guidance should accompany them. 
clear communication on the duration, their rationale, and their implementation should help to limit inefficiencies owing to uncertain policy environments. Otherwise, financial stability can quickly be undermined. Additional welfare improvements resulting from dividend restrictions are worth pointing out. Dividend restrictions can increase solvency and loss absorption capacity at the same time, simultaneously. This is a feature that capital releases might not have. This means that in the event of a bail-in, shareholders, debt holders, sorry, and potentially also tax pay taxpayers will bear a lower cost. Moreover, dividend restriction can address one of the problems related to the releases of macroprudential or general, general capital requirements, which can be misused to distribute more dividends instead of to provide more loans or set aside capital. By combining the dividend recommendation or a dividend, one type of some sort of dividend restrictions with releases, this un, unintended effect can be, can be canceled. We think that overall, based on our paper, we have a new kid on the block, and there is a new policy of the, the tool as a disposal of supervisor to be used in the future crisis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Ernest, and the discussant is Diana Bonfin from Banco de Portugal and Catolica Lisbon. Thank you, and the ECB as well. So I'm, I'm in the opposite direction of Florian. I get more affiliations, and uh, and actually, um, yeah, the, the the disclaimer is so long that I think it's not even here on the slide, but it it for sure applies. Uh, okay, so. Um, so, so basically, I mean, I, I think what the paper um, tells us about is this uh, restriction on dividends that was implemented at the beginning of COVID. So if we think about how things work uh, in a crisis, supervisors want to be sure that the banks have the ability to absorb losses, right? But if, you, if during the crisis you're going to ask banks to increase capital requirements, this is going to have procyclical effects. And so one solution that was adopted here uh, two, three years ago was to tell banks not to distribute dividends to make sure they would be able to increase their loss absorbing capacity. So the, the recommendation issued at the beginning of the pandemic said that at least until October 2020, no significant institutions should pay out dividends. And so what Ernst and co-authors do in this paper is to try to understand how did this recommendation issued by the ECB affect banks' lending and risk-taking. Sorry. So um, they find that this dividend restriction was actually quite effective uh, in avoiding a credit crunch. So what the banks did was to use these non-distributed dividends to lend more and to lend more especially to smaller uh, and medium firms, as well as to firms in the sectors that were being more heavily affected by the pandemic. And they also cannot find any evidence of additional risk-taking or, or zombie lending. So my comments will, will be mainly on three, three topics, on, on bank profitability and dividend bans, on why do banks, understanding why do banks follow the recommendation, and then I will also talk a little bit about the magnitudes, and finally also a little bit about the interaction with other policies. So the identification strategy here in the paper uh, is to explore heterogeneity across banks in the area on the, on the dividends that the banks had planned to distribute but did not do so. And this is reported as a percentage of risk-weighted assets uh, according to a survey that the ECB conducted in March 2020. And so when we think about this uh, treatment variable, um, higher values of planned but not distributed dividends can mean different things. Well, first, they can mean compliance with the recommendation. And this is the, 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 the interpretation of the authors, okay? So if I see that the bank was planning to distribute dividends, but it did not, well, the bank was for sure compliant. But it can mean other things. It can also be uh, related to risk preferences of the bank managers. Okay, so the, the this is a soft recommendation, so the banks could choose whether or not to comply. And we cannot be totally sure that the bankers wouldn't decide to do this, even if the ECB had not recommended them to, to do so. And actually, I mean, we, if you look at how banks were behaving at that time, they also increased uh, their uh, impairments, ex ante. So this would be consistent with, the, with this evidence um, of, of prudent behavior from the banks early in the pandemic. So the banks were claiming they wanted to be part of the solution, not part of the problem this time. So maybe they would have restricted the distribution of dividends anyway. 
And another thing that this variable can be related to is bank profitability. Okay, so the banks that higher, had higher amounts of this dividends to be distributed were for sure those that were more profitable before COVID started. Okay, so one another possibility looking into these results could be that, well, maybe the banks that were more profitable before the pandemic were in better conditions to then lend more once the, once the, 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 the pandemic starts. So, I mean, here just to conclude this part, I think it would be um, important to, to, to discuss these alternative explanations for what we see and how we look into the data. But I'll come back to this. My second set of comments is about why, why do banks follow the recommendation? So first, I mean, by, by when the bank managers decide to follow the recommendation, there's two different things at least they can do. Okay, so in the slides there were three, but, but here I aggregated them in two. So one thing the banks can do is, well, let's act counter-cyclically and increase lending. And this is the goal of macroprudential authorities, right? So, so macroprudential policy would want to kind of have this counter-cyclical dimension and make sure that at the peak of the crisis, there's not going to be a credit crunch. But banks can also uh, decide to follow the recommendation and not distribute dividends to increase their loss absorbing capacity. And this would be more the goal of the microprudential authorities of the bank supervisors. And what we see in this paper is that the decision that the, the, the ECB adopted from a microprudential perspective actually had very positive microprudential effects. So I think this is great news for microprudential policy. And I think it also delivers food for thought in terms of the interactions and, and potential conflicts of interest between macro and micro pool. But what, where I think the paper, the paper falls short a little bit is actually showing us evidence about the primary goal of the supervisors when announcing this. So there's this technical report that Ernst participated in that where, where there's some descriptive evidence about what happened to banks' capital and what did they do, how did they adjust the balance sheets to, as a reaction to this um, recommendation. But here in this paper, the focus is really on the lending activity. So I think it would be important to complement the evidence in this paper also to this broader adjustment in balance sheets and to understand how these, um, these, these different dimensions interact. Still on this point, I, I think the empirical strategy in, in the paper is not straightforward. So the, the authors start with these 110 banks, and there were 35 banks that in the survey uh, in March 2020, they, they said immediately they were not planning to distribute dividends. These go into the control group. And then there were 75 banks that said they were planning to do so. And among these, there were 53 that even though they were planning to do, they, they, they didn't do it. And so this is the treatment group. This is where the action is being explored. And then there are other groups that there are other banks that go into the control group. There's 11 banks that have already distributed or approved it. There's one bank that actually distributed more than planned. And there's 10 other banks that, that went ahead and distributed what they planned. And so in the paper, there's some discussion about how to think about this control group. I think much more of it is, is, is needed because this is clearly not, not an easy discussion. Um, I, I actually, something where, where, where this is also important is to, 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 to have more convincing evidence about parallel trends. How, because these, these banks are not the same. As, as I said already, these banks had different profitability levels. So banks that were planning to distribute more dividends, for sure they were more profitable. And given also that compliance is a choice of the banks, I think it would be really important to, 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 to be clear first on the discussion on how the control group is formed, and second on showing us more evidence about parallel trends. For instance, Jose Luis showed us these charts with the dynamic differences and differences. That I think is a much clearer way to understand how similar these banks were, were before the recommendation. Uh, also, all the results are, are anchored on this intensity of treatment by exploring the differences in, in the amount of div dividends that the banks plan to distribute. I think also just looking into treated versus non-treated banks, which is less linked to profitability, I think this could be something uh, worth exploring. Then I have one, one, one question about the magnitudes uh, that are reported in the paper. So the main result, the number that you want to take away, is that in the absence of this ECB recommendation, lending growth would have been 2.1 percentage points lower. But then a little bit later in the paper, when the authors go and look into the role of government guarantees on bank loans, they show that th this effect in the absence of government guarantees would have been between 1.5 to 1.9 percentage points, which is 
almost the same as very close to, to the entire uh, effect. So I wonder if this meant that actually the dividend recommendation had much stronger effects on bank lending than the government guarantees. Of course, it's not easy to, 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 to disentangle this, but I think it's worthwhile trying to, to address the question. Also, uh, the results are much larger for firms that borrow from several banks at the same time. Uh, so here looking into the magnitudes of the effects, I, I find this puzzling because another conclusion in another part of the paper is that the effects are actually larger for small and medium firms, which are less likely to borrow from multiple banks. So, so again, this is something I would explore more. Then my, my last point is about uh, other policies. Okay, and of course this is a tricky point, an easy point to make, rather than and not so easy to address. Uh, I think the authors do a great job in trying to control for as much um, confounding policies that were implemented at the time. So on fiscal policy, they control for the information that exists in the credit, which is government guarantees and moratorium on loans. But here on the right hand side, this is a picture from uh, the ESRB report on, on, on fiscal support during COVID. And for instance, that first set of bars is about other fiscal policy measures, excluding the government guarantees. And so that is also a big, a big, a big uh, element of support, and, and, and that cannot be captured here. Also, monetary policy is captured by the uptake of TLTR03 and the deposits at the central bank. I, I wonder if this is enough. Uh, and also, we don't know enough about the buffer releases. Then just one minor thing. I mean, so so, so the paper claims to be the first um, to um, this this to be the first time that dividend restrictions were implemented. Well, actually, in Portugal they were implemented. I, I don't remember if it was under Governor Constancio or or right after that. Sorry for that. I should have. But this was uh, this was uh, when we were trying to avoid the bailout. So before the Troika came in, one of the decisions that was implemented was first let's ask the banks to stop paying their dividends. And so, well, maybe another paper needs to be written on this to, to get more external validity. And, but so just to conclude, um, I think that, sorry, just to conclude, uh, it seems that, I mean, the, the results in this paper are very clear in showing that recommending banks to restrict uh, dividend distribution seems to be quite effective and does not lead to dis distortions. So these are great news, but it's actually kind of surprising there aren't any drawbacks. So I wonder if this is the, the silver bullet that now we have to solve any kind of problems. Okay, so thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Diana. And now we have uh, time for questions, first from within the room. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jean-Edouard Collier from HEC Paris. Um, I just wanted to follow up on, on Diana's last slide, actually. So what, what seems a bit special with this, with this policy is that the dividends were already planned, and then you cancel them, right? So if you take the signaling theory of dividends seriously, what this means is that you already benefited from the signal, and then you don't have to distribute the money. So of course, this has a positive impact on lending, in a sense, right? You get it for free, even. Um, I think that the real cost of such a policy would be that if you do it you know, repeatedly, then you lose the signaling function and presumably you have issues with the allocation of capital among banks and so on. So I was wondering whether there was a possibility to look at that, you know, measures of how capital was allocated in the banking sector because that's where I would look for potential costs. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other questions from the floor? If that's the case, uh, Andrea, something in the chat? Let's wait a uh, few seconds, but so far everyone is uh, satisfied. Okay, then I will take another question, and then uh, if you have less questions, it's also fine to bring us back to the schedule. Um, you looked um, uh, very well at the positive impacts, the intended impacts of the um, uh, um, dividend recommendation. And as I, I wonder, to get the full picture, wouldn't you also need to look at let's say the funding cost of banks, uh, also on a more persistent basis, if there was also maybe a price to pay. Thank you. So first of all, thank you, Diana, for uh, very constructive comments, and um, uh, a lot of them, actually. So we'll try to, we'll try to go through your slides and improve, improve the paper. Um, regarding the, the, the first one, in terms of... Uh, uh, the risk preferences of uh, of managers, yes, of course. I mean, um, we don't we don't have a counterfactual on that side, of course, because it's it's going to be difficult to to see what will have happened with those dividends. I mean, my sense is that the banks will have distributed them anyway. Uh, perhaps maybe a couple of outliers not, uh, 
um, I don't think that uh, it could have been systemic, uh, systematic behavior by 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 banks to not distribute dividends given the COVID crisis. But uh, but still, uh, it's a valid point, and maybe we have to touch upon that in, in the paper to make sure that um, that uh, this at least has been suggested by uh, by uh, by a discussant. Uh, profitability. We have a table in the paper that, um, well, first of all, we control for a bunch of uh, um, bank level variables. Profitability is among them. Uh, some indicators of profitability are among them. And uh, and then we have a table in the in the annex that uh, looks uh, only at banks that had positive plans to distribute dividend dividends and not and and exclude the banks that uh, from the control group the banks that did not that are generally less profitable so they don't have anything to distribute. To the to the shareholders, and actually, our, the point estimates are, are the same. Uh, uh, weirdly enough, the same in in size and and uh, and direction to the to the baseline. But we can we can of course reinforce that argument in the in the paper. Interaction between micro and macro, of course, it's it's all capital requirements. You, you know, macro cap, macro prudential capital requirements are are the same type of. Uh, they are just called differently, but in the end, it's. Uh, it's, they have different reasoning, of course, and different uh, rationale why they are applied, but it's still, you know, uh, capital over equated assets. So there is an interaction over there in terms of micro and macro. It's it's nice it's nice that you pointed out to that, um, and we will we will flag it as well, maybe. The technical report on capital provisions and uh, at the bank level. This was at the bank level, and at the bank level, we could of course observe, uh, you know, the capital behavior. How much of these funds were allocated to capital? How much to loans and how much to to provisions? With Anna Credit, we go a bit deeper to to reinforce our our, our identification of, of the effects, and we cannot uh, really look into the into one of the one of the aspects in terms of capital. There is this technical report over there. We didn't we didn't think about expanding it into our paper, but uh, we we mention it in the we we. We indulge in self-citation, and, and we mentioned it in the paper as, as, as evidence of, of some of the alternative alternative distribution mechanisms or allocation mechanisms of this of this policy. Then, regarding your sample issue of 110 versus 99 or 100, um, so 110 is the, is the total banks of, of that we have in our sample. But then, in our estimations, we have 99 because of uh, missing data and other things that uh, that uh, affect this. We take on board the, the suggestion of the dy dynamic difference in difference. We will implement that and try to see how that that uh, what what does that tell us us and uh, discrete discrete treatment variable as well. So thank you very much for the, for for those points. Um, we need to rephrase a couple of sentences. I, I, I realize in, te, in the absence of government guarantees, because there is a confusion there. Um, what we say that we find a, a, an impact of 2.1 percentage points, if we scale back, you know, the the classical interpretation of increase of 100 percentage points, uh, the impact on estimates. We have uh, in our sample banks that have uh, this ratio that we use as a main variable being around half. So if we have the effects, we get to 2.1. Without government guarantees, it's still a one percent to interpretation. So it's not; it, it will be hard. Also, the other one. So that's uh, that's that's the thing. And uh, thank you for pointing out to this Wall Street Journal article. We 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 missed that one, and uh, that's actually very useful. And we will look if there is anything that has been written about that, and actually what banks did at that time, if they followed it or not. So what uh, what was the behavior? Um, Jean Rab, thank you for your comment. Um, of course, here it's kind of as you say, it's it's an easy choice. We look at the lending, and of course, that you're gonna find some positive effects. The question is how big, and you know, you want to do it properly and everything you to, to, to see. Um, in terms of costs, there are costs, and this goes back also to the question by by Klaus. There are costs that we don't address directly in this paper that are difficult to address also in terms of cost of funding, because at that time in 2020, no banks basically issued any capital. I mean, uh, it would have been uh, a strange choice to issue some capital at the time, of course, because the stocks were plunging and, uh, you know, the cost of funding, of course, was higher. But in the medium term, uh, and actually coming back from, re from a recent conference in Brussels, we were thinking about the medium term cost of these policies. So you can look at, for example, at the issuances before COVID and issuances now in the last couple of years and how, you know, the pricing or the... The, the, the demand versus the offer, the supply and demand effects have changed in respect to the, 
how much banks were defund, de demanding in terms of capital, how much was the supply there, what was the, the different costs. It's, it's going to be a challenge to collect the data, but I think that that avenue can, can, can answer some of those questions. And in particular, comparing those banks that decided to strictly follow the, the ECB, or comparing also actually the US with Europe. But the US, they have also a different type of recommendation, but not as um, strict as, as in Europe. So it was more kind of rule-based instead of uh, to court. So maybe that could be that could be an avenue for, for future research, of course, to, to, to be looking at the medium-term costs of these of these policies. And I agree with you, it cannot be repeated, it cannot be a repeated interaction game between the supervisor and the markets of the banks, because of course financial stability and, and, and other issues can be can be undermined. And this also goes back to, to, to your question, Klaus. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. So I think we have all earned now a short break. So we reconvene at 1600 for PM and let's give a hand to the great presentations, the great presenters and also the good questions that we have, um, as have been asked.